All right, here we go. We're in the book of Revelations, decoding the book of Revelation. We want to do it from a Jewish perspective. I think that's so important. So let's begin with Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 1 through 4. He's standing on the seashore, and he sees a beast rising up out of where? Uh, whenever you talk of Israel, you always talk of the land. When you talk of the nations, you talk of the sea. All right? So just think the sea represents the nation. There's a beast rising up out of the sea. And is it strange? It's got seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns. Upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto what? A leopard. So I got a leopard here. But it also has a bear's feet in a lion's mouth. What a strange creature. And we see the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So, I mean, to have great authority, this beast has got to rule much of the world in one sense or another. But we see one of his heads is wounded to death. The deadly wound gets healed. All the world is wondering after the beast. And they worship the dragon who gives power to the beast. And they worship the beast. And look at what they said. Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Well, what's fascinating about this phrase, who is like unto the beast? That's exactly what they say about God as the opposite in Exodus, it's called the Mika Mocha, not make me a mocha, Mika a mocha, okay? Who is like unto thee? We find it right here in Exodus 15, 9 through 13. <clears throat> now notice the contrast. First off, what does the enemy say? <clears throat> I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust will be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Wow. <clears throat> A bunch of I wills. Pretty prideful. Okay, this is representing Satan. And look at this. You did blow with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Here it is. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You in your mercy led forth your people, which you have redeemed. So Satan always wants to take the place of God. He wants everyone looking at him saying, Woo, who is mighty like the beast? Who is like unto him? <clears throat> Well, I'll tell you what, God is the one who this is said to. But look at the I wills from Satan in Isaiah 14, 12 through 16. It says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, which weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, here it is, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's where God is, see? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I want to be like there. I will be like the most high. So that's his attitude. And, but God says, you're going to be brought down to hell, buddy, to the sides of the pit. And everyone who sees you is going to narrowly look upon you and consider you saying, what? You're the one who made the earth a tremble and shake kingdoms? I wouldn't be surprised if Satan's about this tall. <laughs> I mean, I just see this, this little mini me, you know, this, this little thinking, you know, he's so, everyone goes, it's like, you're the one that's scared. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, you know. He likes to project himself as some, you know, big tough guy. And this is what he's going to do. And God just kind of like a fly. Let's look at Revelation 13, verse 5 through 7. <clears throat> he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Kind of like Isaiah 14. He's speaking great things. He's blaspheming the God of Israel. And power was given to him for only how long? 42 months, three and a half years. 
<clears throat> what does he do? He opens up his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. A lot of people don't like reading that verse. But it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Well, I think it's fascinating in Daniel 7, verse 1 through 3, when we look at parallels, it was in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, that Daniel has a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. And he wrote down the dream and he told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, this is what I saw by visions by night. Behold, there were four winds of heaven striving on the great sea. Four great beasts are coming up from the sea. They're all diverse one from another. Now, <clears throat> I think this is fascinating when we look at what we read in Revelation of the leopard, the lion, and the bear, look what he sees. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings, until, and I beheld till the wings were plucked, and it was lifted from the earth, and made stand on the feet as a man, a man's heart was given to it. And then comes the second beast, like a what? A bear. And it raised up itself on its side, had three ribs in the mouth, between the teeth, and they said to it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this, I beheld another one like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings of a bird and the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. I don't know if I call that a dream or a nightmare. <clears throat> but look at verse, back to Revelation, chapter 13, 8 through 10. And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb who's been slain from the foundation of the world. How many of you want to be written in the book? Amen. This is why every Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, they say, may you be inscribed in the book. And then it says, if anyone has an ear to hear, let them hear. Now, here's the thing about that. What's the Hebrew word for hear? Which really means hear and obey. So really, if anyone has an ear, let them obey. Whoever leads into captivity will be going to captivity. Whoever kills with the sword has to be killed with the sword. And here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Wow. Now compare this to Daniel 7, verse 7 and 8. Here in the night visions, he beheld this fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, strong, exceedingly, had great iron teeth. Probably needs to see a dentist. But look at this. It devoured and broken pieces. And it stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it. It had how many horns? That's what we saw in Revelation. He considered the horns. And there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. We see this a lot. This is how you're going to know the Antichrist. He's going to be very boastful, very proud, talking of I, I, me, my, mine. <clears throat> and uh, the other thing we learn here is the pattern. Because in one sense, this was already fulfilled during Hanukkah. But this is why we need to realize Hanukkah will happen again. So let's go to Revelation 13, 11 through 14. He sees another beast, but where's this beast coming out of? The earth, not the seas. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. That refers to Satan. And look at this. He exercises all the power of the first beast that came before him, and he causes the earth and those that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now look what he does. He does what kind of wonders? Great wonders. He even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of people. So he deceives those that dwell on the earth by the means of the miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. You know what's fascinating to me about this? <clears throat> Here, this beast has fire come down from heaven to earth, and so everyone's going to believe him when he does this miracle. 
what's amazing, a couple of things that are amazing to me. Number one, miracles do not spur faith. They don't. And a lot of pe people in the church today are following false prophets and false prophecy, and they're looking for miracles and signs, and that's what they follow. That's why they're the ones that are going to be so deceived. Who else had fire come down from heaven to earth? Elijah. Look at 1 Kings 18, 38 and 39. <clears throat> then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench and everyone saw it and they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But not only with the prophets of Baal, in 2 Kings 1, many times this event we're about to read happened. It wasn't just once. Here Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Many times these people came and Elijah said, okay, fire fall from heaven and destroy you. Here's my point. I believe the Antichrist, the false prophet, are going to play themselves off as Moses and Elijah. They're going to be doing the miracles, and so everyone's going to say, wow, they must be Moses and Elijah. I don't think they're going to come looking mean with horns and all this kind of stuff. They're going to be doing miracles. But the way you know is look at the fruit. Watch what, how they speak, okay? Watch what they want you to do. Because look at Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. This is the key. How many of you know Yeshua? What was Yeshua a prophet? Did what he say come to pass? Did he perform miracles? Okay, now this is, this is going to be a shocker for some of you that haven't been here for a while. Okay, how do you know the sign of a true prophet? If what he says come to pass, right? That's only half right. Okay, and you're going to see why here in just a second. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and look at this, the sign or the wonder does come to pass. It says, where have he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods which you've not known and serve them. You're not to hearken to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God has proven you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So here's the thing, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to be having fire fall from heaven, doing all these wondrous miracles to get believers to believe. But when they create an image and tell everyone to worship it, because in their mind the Torah is done away with, they're not going to have a problem doing it. They're, they're not going to understand this verse that God is really testing to see if you love him and if you're going to fall into idolatry. This is why I think the deception is going to be so strong. Look at Daniel 7, <clears throat> verse 17 through 22. These great beasts, which are four, here, now we get the interpretation, and I always believe that letting the Bible interpret itself. There are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. The saints of the Most High are going to take the kingdom, yay, and possess the kingdom for how long? Even forever and ever. And then he says, I want to know the truth of the fourth beast, which was different from all the other ones. That was exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass. He devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue of his feet. And then he says, concerning the ten horns that were in his head. And of the other one which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And he says, I beheld, and this same horn made war with who? The saints. And he prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. All right, so we get the victory. This is important to know. So in Daniel 7, 23 through 25, Look at this. He says the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom on earth, which is going to be different from all other kingdoms. It's going to devour the whole earth, tread it down, break it into pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are the ten kings that are going to rise and another one to rise after them. He'll be diverse from the first. He'll subdue three kings and he shall speak what? 
great words against the Most High. He's going to wear out the saints of the Most High. He's going to think to change the biblical calendar. And they'll be given into his hand for three and a half years. But do you notice how the key to understanding who the Antichrist is? He is full of pride, boasting words, blasphemes God. And but do you remember in the story of the Exodus? Well, actually, this is in Genesis first. When Abraham is basically unconscious, he's having a vision of the lamp going between the pieces and everything. And God is telling Abraham that it's going to be 400 years. Do you remember why he said it was? The iniquity had not yet come to the full. Remember that? Well, look right here in Daniel 8, 23 to 26. In the last days of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, God is waiting for the summation, the fullness of iniquity to come. There will be a king of fierce countenance, understanding dark sentences he's, or riddles, and he'll stand up. His power will be mighty, but it's not by his own power. Why? He's getting it from Satan. He'll destroy wonderfully. And look at this. He's going to prosper. He's going to practice and will destroy the mighty and the holy people. I think this could also refer to Israel. Through his policy, he'll cause witchcraft to prosper in his hand. But look at this. He will magnify himself in his heart. He's not magnifying the Torah. He's magnifying himself in his heart. And by what? By peace, he's going to destroy many. Isn't that interesting? There's going to be a peace agreement that is coming that is going to cause great destruction. And they'll also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. The vision of the evening and the morning, which is told is true. Shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Now look at Daniel 11, 36 through 39. This king is going to do according to his own will. I will, I will, I will. He'll exalt himself. He'll magnify himself above every God. And he's going to speak marvelous things against the God of gods and prosper until the iniquity comes to the full. And that's what's determined to be done. Then it says he'll not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he's going to magnify himself above all. And in his estate, he will honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers did not know. He'll honor with gold and silver, precious stones and pleasant things. He'll do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he'll acknowledge and increase with glory. And he will cause them to rule over many. And he's going to do what? Divide the land. It's like there's going to be a division of Israel one way or another. And then let's go back to Revelation 13 as we tie all this together. Verse 15 through 17, he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should be able to speak. How many of you have seen things like that before? You know, in one sense, they, even now, they have the ability for someone, even candidates, to appear holographically in one place and speak. I've showed you a video of that not too long ago of that happening. And causes as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, all to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, everyone always asks, what's the mark? What is the mark of the beast? Well, look at Revelation 13, 18. Here is What? Wisdom, let him that under, has understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of a man, and his number is 666. Well, here's what's interesting. Uh, there's a couple things I want to mention. First off, I think it's a fascinating connection between this verse and Solomon, who's known for wisdom. And the only other place 666 is mentioned in the Bible is with Solomon talking about the weight of gold that comes into him every year was 666. But if you'll notice, it is spelled out. It is not Roman numeral 6, Roman numeral 6, Roman numeral 6. It is the words 666. It's written in Greek. In Greek, it is chi, stigma. 
Well, just like in Hebrew and Greek, the letters are not only numbers, they can be words. Well, did you know Cheeksy stigma, which is translated as 666, really is a phrase. It's a word. That's what's fascinating. And when you look it up, you can see, wow, this isn't just a number. It's a word phrase. And how many of you have, uh, I remember you've raised Catholics. How many Catholics, former Catholics here? How many of you have heard of a stigmata? This is cheeksy stigma. And what that means is, is to receive a mark as proof of ownership. The very word 666 in the Greek refers to receiving a cut or an incision as proof of ownership. That's why it's important not just to look at the number, but at the, the word or the phrase. Now, look at Revelation 14, 1 through 3. And I looked, and lo, there is a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him are the 144,000 we read about a couple weeks ago. And instead of having a number marked on them, they have their father's name written in their foreheads. His name. It's not a number. It's a name. It's God's. How many of you want God's name written on you? That's what's important because you're not a number. And then he hears a voice from heaven, a voice of many waters. Wow, where have we heard that before? And a voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. It's not so bad to be harping. And they sing a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. See, the devil has to have his beast. God has his beast, so the devil has to have his beast. The elders and no man could learn this song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. If you remember, there's 12,000 from every tribe. And we saw that he heard this voice that was the voice of many waters. Look at Ezekiel 43, verse 1 and 2. Ezekiel is brought to the gate, the eastern gate, and the glory of the God of Israel is coming from the way of the east. And his voice is like the noise of many waters. And the earth signed with his glory. Mount of Olives is to the east. And Yeshua says in the Gospels, as lightning goes from the east to the west, so shall it be when the Son of Man appears. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives, which is to the east, and his voice is going to thunder, and it's going to be like the noise of many waters. As a matter of fact, look at Isaiah 59, 20 and 21, concerning Revelation, where the Lamb is standing on Mount Zion, we find the Redeemer is going to come where? To Zion. This is why they want to divide Jerusalem. This is why it's always, Jerusalem is at the epicenter of everything that's going on, all the politics, because the devil knows God is going to rule and reign from there. And so he wants to divide it. He wants his half. And it says, the Redeemer will come to Zion to them that turned from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord, as for me. He says, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words which I put in your mouth are not going to depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your seed, nor out of the mouth of your seed. Seed, says the Lord, from henceforth and forever. It's always about the mouth. Satan, his mouth is full of cursing, blasphemy, pride, ego. But what God wants to do is put his words in your mouth. So that's why it's so important to be careful how we speak, what we speak, because speech is important in the dividing line of what's coming in this world today. And Psalm 144, 9 through 11, it says, I will sing a new song to you, O God, upon the psaltery, on the instrument of 10 strings, I'll sing praises. It is he that gives salvation to kings, who delivers David his servant from the hurtful sword. And then look what the psalmist says. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouths speak what? Vanity. The right hand is the right hand of falsehood. In other words, they're liars. So what's the difference between the fake news and God's people? Look at Revelation 14, 4 and 5. These are they which were not defiled with women. They are virgins. They are they which followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God, to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile. 
for they're without fault before the throne of God. That's why I don't have this in your notes, but everyone knows James. And the whole book of James talking about the tongue is a very wicked member and it sets on fire the, the course of hell for that matter. And then Psalm 32 too. Blessed is the one whom the Lord does not impute iniquity to and in whose spirit there is no guile. And we're going to close with this verse from Zephaniah. This is one of my favorite verses. Chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. There's always a remnant. It's always about the remnant. The remnant of Israel will not do iniquity, nor speak lies, nor will there be a deceitful tongue found in their mouth. That is so important. They're going to feed and lie down. No one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad. Rejoice with all the heart. O daughter of Jerusalem. Here it is. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord. Wow, he's the king of Israel. Is in your midst. You'll see evil no more. In that day, it'll be said to Jerusalem, fear not and to Zion, let not your hands be slack. And here's a verse everyone has memorized. For the Lord your God in the midst of you is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will rest in his love. And he's going to joy over you with singing. Can you imagine? Do you know what is actually said in Genesis 1-1? When God spoke creation, he actually sang it. He was singing as the world was created. And that's an amazing thought. I can just, I bet he has a pretty good voice. <laughs> I'm jealous. I don't have a voice at all. But I tell you what, I, uh, to me, we want purity. Purity is where it's at. No guile, no fake news, honest truth. That's what God is looking for, a people who are going to speak his words. Are we speaking our words or his words? That's the hardest thing is how many of you, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. And God says, how about a piece of mine? Wow, that's heavy. So what we need to do, and we want to really think about this year in particular, uh, with everything that is going on. If you remember, Miriam was struck with a plague. It was leprosy. Do you remember why she was struck with a plague? Her mouth. And I believe with uh, literally with the plagues and different things that are coming on this world, we have to protect our mouth. We got to protect our heart because out of the abundance of heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. And that's why I think this prayer that you can pick up and back, or if you don't have it, you can print it on when you get home on your computer from, I believe, our website or from somewhere. Um, or we'll have more next week. This is what we need to be speaking. How many want to speak health? That's what we need to do, not only to ourselves, but to our loved ones. You know, this is what is so important. This is such a blessing when we learn to speak blessing and health. Uh, I believe that our uh, backstabbing, fake news, lying, that is going to be one of the big dividing lines in these last days. So we have to protect our speech. Amen? Amen. So if the worship team or, will come up, we're going to pray, and then we're going to head over to the new building on Taruma, and we're going to offer, a, offer up some prayer uh, that the Lord bless that place. That Can you imagine the light of the Torah will be going to all the world from that one location? Thanks to you. So amen. Amen and amen. Let's stand, and we'll pray, and we'll have uh, the Zakans. Why don't the, the uh, or not the Zakans, but our prayer team. Why don't the prayer team go ahead and come up? I'm ending a little bit early just because we want to get over to the new buildings. You guys can go home and have lunch. But if the prayer team would go ahead and come up, and if you want prayer, feel free to come up and pray. Let's just take a moment and uh, worship the Lord and ask him to do a work in all of our hearts, all right? And then our mouths as well. Avidu Mokenu, our Father, our King, we thank you so much that we can come and learn of you. Do a work in our heart. For out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And we only want pure words. We only want your words coming out of our mouths. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen and amen. I can't help but think of Isaiah. When he saw the Lord, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And what did they do? They took a tongue and grabbed a hot coal from off the altar and, and touched his lips.
And I believe right now we need to be asking God to do the same to us, to touch our lips. We bring so much destruction upon ourselves and on our families because of how we speak. But God wants us to be his kids, right? He wants to put his name. We don't want the devil's number, his mark. We want God's mark. We want God's name written upon us. That's always what he wanted. He wanted his kids. And so this is why he told Moses to tell Aaron to say this prayer over his kids, that not only would he bless them, he would put his name upon them. And he told them to say, Ivarekaka Adonai Baish Maraka. Ya'er Adonai Panav Eleka Bichuneka. Ye saw Adonai Panav Eleka Biasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that name above all names, Aye, Asher, Aye. May the Lord bless you and drive safely. Amen. And okay, here we are. The book of Revelations today, we're going to cover chapter 15 and chapter 16. So let's start with Revelation 15, verse 1 and 2. And it's going to remind us of Revelation chapter 4 and 5. You want to connect the dots between Revelation 15 with Revelation 4 and 5. Let's look at the connections here. We'll start where it says, John says, I saw another sign in heaven. It was great. It was amazing. There were seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be, look at this, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Can you imagine this, like this big sea of glass and there's just flames coming up from it? And then he also saw all those who had conquered the beast. Amazing. And its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass. And they all have harps in their hands. The harps of God are in their hands. So these are people who were here on earth that conquered the beast, the image and the number. These weren't people that were taken out, but people who were here. Now, remember Revelation 4 and 5, this sea of glass? Let's go back and look. It says, around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were the 24 elders, clothed in white garments, golden crowns on their heads. And then it says, from the throne came just flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I lived in Kansas where we had rip-roaring thunderstorms at night. It just scared the bejeebies out of you. Man, dude, had this big bolt crack of lightning and this giant peal of thunder. I can't imagine what it's going to be like being in heaven with all that going on at the same time. And it says before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And then before it says the throne was, as it were, a sea of glass of like crystal. This is the same sea of glass we're looking at in Revelation 15. We're finding in Revelation 4. And then Revelation 5 talks about it. Let's go to verse 8 through 14. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the Lamb. And look at this. Every one of them has a harp in their hand, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then it says they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. You were slain and by your blood you ransomed people. That's what we talked about this morning. For God from every tribe, language, people, and nation, you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they are the ones that's going to reign on the earth. And then I looked, and look at this. I heard around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, they heard the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, that's 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And what are they singing with a loud voice? Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, blessing. And then on top of that, he hears every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth and in the sea and all of them. They're adding to this chorus. 
And they're saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And all the elders fall down and worship. So as we're reading Revelation 15, I want you to see what is going on by connecting it back to chapter 4 and 5. So now let's go to chapter 15 again and look at the next two verses, 3 and 4. What are they singing? The song of Moses, the servant of God. And it's also known as the song of the Lamb. And what are they saying? Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways. <clears throat> o King of the nations, who's not going to fear, Lord? Who's not going to glorify your name? You alone are holy. And look at this. Every nation is going to come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. Wow. <clears throat> This is important because when we look at the tribulation, we're looking at the wrath of God and we're thinking, man, these are horrible. But these are all righteous, the righteous acts of God. In Deuteronomy 31, 30, Moses spoke in the ears of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were finished. That's the song they were to memorize because this is the song we'll be singing. Matter of fact, if you remember in Revelation, what are they ascribing? They're ascribing greatness to God, saying how just and true he is. And look at Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. It says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. He's a God of faithfulness without iniquity. And here it is. Just and upright is he. And look at Psalm 92, 5 through 7. It talks about just how just and upright God is and how great he is. It says, how great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man can't even begin to know. The fool can't understand this. That though the wicked, they sprout like grass. Listen to this. Even though the wicked sprout like grass and all the evildoers are flourishing, they are doomed to destruction forever. Psalm 111, 2 and 3. Great are the works of the Lord. Guess what? It says they are studied by all who delight in them. Full, and, full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. Over and over throughout the scriptures, they're ascribing greatness to God. Look at Jeremiah. This is chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. Who wouldn't fear you, O king of the universe, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. They are but stupid and foolish. Let's go back to Revelation 15, 5 and 6. John says this, After I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. Can you imagine? Remember Moses' tabernacle, Solomon's temple. Everything was patterned after the heavenly one. And all of a sudden the heavens open and they see the real Ark of the Covenant, the real menorah, uh, the living Torah. And look at what it says. Here they all have... Out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, bright linen. They all had golden sashes around their chests. Man, these plagues are coming. Don't we live in interesting times? Look at Leviticus 26, 21. God says, look, guys, if you walk contrary to me and you don't hearken to me, I am going to bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Here come seven angels with seven plagues. And God says, look, if you guys don't want to be me, I'm going to bring seven times more plagues. So look what happens. This is the, the day of atonement. Revelation 15, verse 7 and 8. One, one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And then it says the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. God is doing this alone. Well, what's interesting, we're reading this in Revelation 15. No one could enter the sanctuary. We'll look at Leviticus 16, 17. This is a Yom Kippur service, the Day of Atonement. It says, no one may be in the tent of meeting from the time 
the high priest enters to make atonement until he comes out and has made atonement for himself, for his house, for all the assembly of Israel. God himself is making atonement for the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, look at Jeremiah. This is chapter 25, verse 15 and 18. It says, thus the Lord, the God of Israel, tells Jeremiah, listen to what he says. It's amazing. It's tied right into the book of Revelation. He tells Jeremiah, okay, take from my hand this cup of the wine of the wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They're going to drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I'm going to send among them. So Jeremiah says, I took the cup of the Lord's hands and I made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me to drink it. Jerusalem, the city of Judah, its kings, officials, to make them a desolation, a waste, a hissing, a curse as it is this day. Wow. So that means not only is Jerusalem drinking this cup of wine's wrath, but every nation of the earth will as well. So what do we find in Revelation 16? Verse 1 and 2. John says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, All right, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So what happens? We, start, we have the first angel. He goes and poured out his bowl on the earth. And guess what happens? The first one is harmful and painful boils or sores came upon the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped its image. Well, I can't help but think of Exodus 9, 8 and 9. Here we see that the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the kiln. Let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh and it'll become fine dust over the, all the land of Egypt and become boils, breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So we have a tie-in in the Exodus of boils and here in Revelation boils. Matter of fact, here's Deuteronomy 28, 35. God specifically says, the Lord, if you disobey, is going to strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils, of which you cannot be healed, from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. Can you imagine having a grievous boil right on your knees and on your legs? Who can walk? And so first thing is attacked is the flesh. Now comes the sea. Revelation 16, 3, the second angel pours out his bowl into the ocean, the sea. And it becomes, it says, like the blood of a corpse. Every living thing died that was in the sea. Well, I can't help but think of Exodus. Let's tie in 719 when the Lord tells Moses to tell Aaron to take your staff and stretch it out over the waters of Egypt on their rivers, canals, ponds, pools of water, and they all will become blood, even in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. So here we have the first plague is on human flesh. The next one is on the sea. Well, guess what? The third one is on the river. So not only are the seas affected, even the rivers so be they salt water or fresh water, both are going to be affected. He says the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is, who was, for you brought these judgments. So in other words, these judgments of God that are coming are just judgments. They're deserved judgments. He says, because they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you've given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. That's right in the book. And then I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your judgments. That's the song of Moses. So in Revelation 16, 8 and 9, we now have the fourth angel pouring out his bowl. And guess where it goes? On the sun itself. It was allowed to scorch people with fire. So the heat is going to be extremely intense. They were scorched by the fierce heat and they cursed the name of God who had the power over these plagues and get a load of this. They did not repent or give God glory. That's why it's, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. The wrath of God will never lead anyone to repentance. And we see here God is pouring out his wrath and guess what? They don't repent. That's why I believe a lot of this preaching, trying to get people to repent by preaching the wrath of God, it never works. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Okay, Exodus 10, 22, uh, 
Well, Revelation 16, 10, 11, the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And its kingdom is plunged into darkness. So people gnaw their tongues again in anguish and they curse the God of heaven because of their pain, their sores. And again, they did not repent of their deeds. So in verse eight and nine, they did not repent when the sun is scorching them. And then all of a sudden the sun, the sun goes out. And so now they're plunged into darkness. And again, they did not repent. They're complaining because of this too bright. Now they're complaining it's too dark. Well, again, I can't think, help but think of Exodus 10, 22, when Moses stretches out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. Now we have the sixth angel. We're going to go to Revelation. This is chapter 16, verse 12 through 14. The sixth angel pours out his bowl on a specific river. It's the river Euphrates. And now all of its water dries up. And the purpose is to prepare the ways for the kings of the east to come marching over. And then get a load of this. Then John says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Frogs are coming out of their mouth. And he says they're demonic spirits. But look at this. These demonic spirits are performing signs. And they go to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. So here we see the Satan, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. And they're all performing miraculous signs. This is why you don't follow miracles. This false prophet is going to perform all kinds of signs. Well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 13. This is verse 1 through 3. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder that he tells you does come to pass. Most people think, well, then it's got to be true. Not so. Listen to what it says. It says that if he then tells you, hey, let's go after other gods, which you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God has just tested you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. So are you going to go fall after signs, or are you going to fall in love with the Lord and do what he says? The false prophets are going to do all kinds of miracles, and so you don't want to follow miracles. Let's go look at 1 Kings. This is an incredible verse. This is 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 21 through 23. A spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, how will you do that? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. You know what? A lying spirit can be put in the mouth of the prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, it says, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these, your prophets. The Lord has declared a disaster for you. Wow, we have to know true prophets from false prophets. So this takes us back to Revelation 16, verse 15 and 16. And this is what is so important. Here God talks about how he's, the false prophets are going to be doing all kinds of miraculous signs and wonders. And he's going to be telling all kinds of lies or fake news. And then listen to this. Here it is. Revelation 16, 15 and 16. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeps his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So, but the important thing is, and I don't have all the verses here. God is not coming as a thief to his people. He only comes as a thief to the wicked. That's so important. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. So we need to realize he doesn't come as a thief to the church that is awake. Okay, Revelation 16, verse 17 and 18. We now have the seventh angel pouring out his bowl, and his bowl just goes out into the open air, and then a loud voice comes out of the temple from the throne, and what does it say? It is finished. It is done. And then comes flashes of lightning, 
rumblings, peals of thunder, and even a great earthquake, it says. And it says this earthquake is going to be so great never since man has been on the earth. So great was the earthquake. I don't know how many of you have been in an earthquake. It is very troubling. I've been in a couple of earthquakes. But to have one so great where in Isaiah every wall falls to the ground, that's a pretty great earthquake. There's a time coming when we will be rocking and rolling. This takes us back to Zechariah. Chapter 14, 3 through 4, where the Lord goes out to battle against all those nations, referring to Armageddon here. And it says, On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. One half of the mount will move north, the other half south. I believe this is the great earthquake that's talking about in Revelation. Is this one in Zechariah 14, when his feet land on the Mount of Olives and the earth just splits. It's going to be huge. We'll get a load of this. This takes us to Revelation 16, verse 19 through 21. The great city, referring to Jerusalem, was split into three parts, and the cities also of all the nations fell. Can you imagine entire cities of the nations are going to fall? Wow, this is why I want to be in a sukkah at that time and not be on the top of a high-rise building. And it says, God remembered Babylon the Great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island flees away. No mountains were to be found. And then get a load of this. There were great hailstones. How big were these? How many of you have had your car pummeled by hailstones? I, when I lived in Kansas, a lot of car damage due to hailstones. Well, guess what? These hailstones are 100 pounds each. Can you imagine getting a hailstone 100 pounds pounding on your head or on your car? They fell from heaven on people. And what did they do? They cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. Wow. Isaiah 51, verse 17. Wake up! Wake yourself up! Stand up, O Jerusalem! You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. But then again in Jeremiah 25, 15 and 7, the Lord God said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations drink it. And so all the nations are going to drink it. So we see in the end of days, Jerusalem for the last several thousand years has drunk the wine of the cup of wrath of God's fury. But what's happened to them over 2,000 years is going to be condensed within seven years happening to the rest of the world. In Exodus 9, verse 23 and 24, we make the connection where Moses stretches out his hand toward heaven. And the Lord sends thunder and hail and fire runs down to the earth. And then the Lord rains hail on the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Wow, so again, there's all these parallels between the plagues in the Exodus and the plagues in Revelation. But here's the thing, just as we read in Revelation, we find the same thing happened in Egypt. In Exodus 9.34, when Pharaoh saw the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again, hardened his heart, he and his servants. In other words, there was no repentance. And so what we need to learn uh, from all of this is that it's not the wrath of God that leads men to repentance. The wrath of God is to be just and it's to pay people back, uh, reward them for their deeds. They're going to get rewarded for what they have done. And it's so important for us as believers to listen and obey. We need to understand God's ways. Just like Moses, in this Torah portion, said, God, I want to understand you. So rather than us thinking we have a God who is so mean and hard and he demands so much with these horrible commandments like love your neighbor, uh, we need to realize that, no, all these commandments are for our good, and we need to return back to a Torah understanding of who God is if we want to make a difference in this world. It's one thing for us not to get the plague. It's another thing for us to be able to stand in the gap and intercede for other people, and they can now come to us for help. So I want all of you uh, not to be in fear with what's going on in the world. No, this is just a practice run for what is really the big game that's coming. And I just pray each one of us uh, that we can learn to run at this time so when the horses come, we can keep up and run with the horses as well. So let's stand and uh, let's pray. 
<clears throat> and ask the, the Lord would just uh, really touch all of us. Uh, before I do, Jill, will there be a closing tape song or will we just go to the priestly blessing? Just a priestly blessing. Okay. Okay, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to close in prayer. And then when we're done, uh, we're going to have Josiah, who sung the priestly blessing uh, last week, uh, sing the priestly uh, blessing for us again. Uh, but for now, uh, let's pray. Avinu Mokenu, our Father and King, I just pray right now, uh, even as families all over the world are listening to this message, they would gather their family together, give them big hugs and love and kisses, Father, that uh, they would know the importance of following your Torah, following your word. And Lord, I, I just pray right now that you truly would bless your people and keep them. Father, shine your face on them and be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace above all measure. And Father, again, I just want to thank you for all those from all over the world live streaming with us who sow into this ministry, Father, that together we can all stop this plague through our prayer, communal prayer. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And we will see you next Shabbat. But no, our offices are open all during the week. Our store is open. Feel free to call. We love you. Take care. We'll see you next Shabbat. Okay, are you ready? Fasten your seat belts. Here we go. We're going to go to the book of Revelations. How many of you feel like we're kind of living in Revelations today? But like I said, this is just the footbed. This isn't the horses. This is why God wants us to have our hearts ready. So here we go. Let's begin with the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 17 now, for those of you that want to follow along. And again, uh, I believe our notes are online, so if you want to print out the notes from this last service, most of them are online except for what I begin with. Uh, but all the notes that I'm covering now are online if you want to print them out. But we're going to begin with Revelation chapter 17, 1 and 2. Let's see what revelation God gave to the apostle Yochanan or John. Here comes one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and he's talking with them, he says, and he said, come here. And he says, I'm going to show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. Now, one thing, when you read about many waters, that always refers to the nations, not the land of Israel. And it says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have, made, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. I love connecting dots. So let's look at Jeremiah <clears throat> chapter 51, verse 6 through 8. Flee out of Babylon. Deliver every man his soul. Don't be cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. And he's going to render to her recompense. Now it says Babylon has been like a golden cup in the hand of the Lord. That made all the earth drunk. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are crazy. They're mad. And then it says, suddenly Babylon is fallen and destroyed. Whenever God acts, it happens suddenly. Be it the resurrection of the dead or the destruction of the wicked. It all comes suddenly. And what do we find in Revelation 17 verse 3? John gets carried away in the spirit into the wilderness. And he sees there a woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. Now this beast is full of names that says of blasphemy. And it's got seven heads and ten horns. What in the world is that all about? Well, let's look at verse 4. The woman herself, she's sitting on a scarlet colored beast. But she's arrayed. In purple and scarlet, she's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And guess what she has in her hand? A golden cup full of abominations and filthiness. And then in verse 5 through 8, it says, Upon her head there was a name that is written, and her name is 
mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman, she was drunk with the blood of the saints. I think this is why she's riding this scarlet colored beast, you know, splattered with blood. With the blood of the martyrs, it says, of Yeshua. Wow, here she is splattered with the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel, guess what he tells me, he says. Why are you marveling about this? Then he says, I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman. Wow, on her name was mystery. And now he's about to tell the mystery of the woman and of the beast that is carrying her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast you saw once existed, and then it wasn't, and then it's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And then it says, all those who are dwelling on the earth are going to wonder. But guess who's going to wonder? It's those, it says, whose names were not written in the book of life. From the foundation of the world, when they behold this beast that was and is not and yet is. So we're not going to wonder, but the rest of the world will. As a matter of fact, if you go to the Daniel, the prophet, chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, it says, After this I saw in the night visions, behold, there was this beast, the fourth beast. He was dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong, and he had great iron teeth. Probably no cavities. And it devoured and it broke in pieces. And then it says it stamped the residue with his feet. And it was different from all the other beasts that were before it. And guess what it had? Ten horns. Hmm, sounds familiar. And then he says, I considered the horns, and there comes up one among them, a little horn. Behold, the first three were plucked up by the roots, and this horn were in it were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Very boastful. Daniel goes on to say in chapter 7, verse 9 through 12, I beheld until all the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days, he sat down on the throne, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame. The wheels, there's wheels on this throne, and they were like burning fire. A fiery stream, it says, issued and came forth from him. Can you imagine this fiery stream as God speaks? And then it says there were thousands of thousands ministering to him. 10,000 times 10,000 were standing before him. The judgment was set. The books were open. <coughs> I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which this horn is speaking. <coughs> I beheld even until the beast was slain and destroyed and given to the burning flames. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion also taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Can you imagine? The day is coming when 10,000 times 10,000 are going to be standing. We're all going to be standing before God's throne with a fiery stream going. Can you imagine 10,000 times 10,000? And you're right there in the crowd. And then God's going to call you out. Okay, it's time for you to give an account. Here you come, and you have to give an account before him. The book is open. Judgment is set. Wow, this is going to determine uh, what did you build with? Wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, precious stones? What the judgment is going to be? Man. Okay, but look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 13 and 14. Oh, no, I'm on Revelation. Sorry, I'm on Revelation 7. Teen, verse 9 through 12. Can't skip one of these. God's words are too cool. Okay. Here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So in one sense, this beast can refer to seven mountains because she's sitting on the beast. She's sitting on seven mountains. And they represent seven kings. So it's not only seven mountains. It's seven kings, which represented by a beast. Five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he continues a short space. And then it says, that beast, 
that was and is not, he will be the eighth. He's of the seven. He goes into perdition. And then it says this, concerning those ten horns, which you saw, they are ten kings. But get a load of this. They have not received the kingdom as of yet. And they receive power as kings for only one hour, not one day, one hour with the beast. But the whole purpose is, is to give everything over to the beast. Look at verse 13 and 14. They have one mind and they're going to give their power and strength to the beast. This is going to happen suddenly. And then it says they're going to make war with the lamb. Me, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to make war with a lion. But a lamb is like, what's the, what's the deal about having a war with a lamb? You know, lambs are pretty timid. Not this lamb. It says... This lamb is going to overcome them. For he is, who is this lamb? It says right here, he's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. And get a load of this. Those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I was just sharing uh, with someone a little bit earlier how poor Jeremiah, I don't know if you knew this, Jeremiah was only like 23 years old when the Lord called him. I mean, that's pretty young. I mean, when you're 23, you, you think you know everything and you're an adult. But uh, those of us that are older know that you're pretty young at 23. <clears throat> and Jeremiah calls, or God calls Jeremiah, and he says, guess what? I called you from the very beginning before you were even born. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah says, no way. I'm just a kid. I'm a child, he says. Don't do this. Uh, but God says, don't you worry. Don't have any fear because I'm going to put my words in your mouth and you're going to speak my words. Well, can you imagine the parallel? Look at this. God, Yeshua, tells us, don't you worry what you're going to say because I'm going to put my words in your mouth. And not only that, you are called, you are chosen, you are faithful. So those of us need to realize, just as Jeremiah realized, we are called for such a time as this. Even though things are happening all around the world, in Jeremiah's day, poor Jeremiah, things are happening around us in our day. But where you have to have the strength come from, your inner strength, is you need to know you are called, you are chosen, you are faithful, and God's going to put his words in your mouth, and you need to trust in and rely on that. And you know if your heart is right with God or not, that that is a promise you can rely on. And so... Um, in Daniel 7, let's go back there for a minute, in 17 through 22, these great beasts, which are four, they're four kings. See, the, the parallels are so similar. We have to understand God's words in uh, the way he describes things. They're going to rise out of the earth. But listen to this. The saints of the Most High are going to take the kingdom. They're going to possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. And then Daniel says, I want to know the truth of this fourth beast, which was diverse from all the other ones, who was exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron. His nails were of brass and he devoured and broke in broken pieces and stomped the residue with his feet. And he said, I also want to know about these ten horns in his head. The other one which came up whom the other ones were before him. And it says, even the one that had the big mouth that spoke great things. I beheld, and that same horde made war with the saints, and he prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was then given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So again, we have to realize in our own mind, even as the book of Revelation may be unfolding before us uh, in this next Shemitah cycle, uh, let me just put in something else here real quick. I mean... Uh, I don't know if you guys realize this, but it was in 2008 when I made the discovery of these uh, blood moons happening on uh, Passover in Sukkot. And then it was a Shemitah year later, seven years later, 2015. Did you know 2015 was a Shemitah year? 2014-15 was a Shemitah year cycle when these four blood moons took place. People don't realize the significance, and I highly recommend uh, people buy the, my book on the blood moons because what I saw was a seven-year cycle. There are a lot of wackles out there that were saying I was saying things I wasn't said, and they wrote books about things that they were saying were going to happen that I never said. But here, I'm going to tell you again, you guys, you need to pass my blood moon book around because here's the thing. 
2008 was the Shemitah cycle, and I saw this happen. And then in 2014, 2015 was the Shemitah year again when these events happened. And what I was telling everybody was that God was trying to get our attention because the next seven year cycle, everything is going to be different and changing. Now, I, didn't, I don't know how to interpret God's signs as much as knowing that he's speaking to us. What was going to unfold, nobody knows until we see. But look what has then happened during these last seven years with the Trump presidency, with everything that's transpired. And look where we're at now. Well, guess what? 2021, 2022 begins the next seven year cycle. OK, so here, not this Rosh Hashanah, but next Rosh Hashanah begins the next seven year cycle. And so what I think this is the precursor for what's going to be coming in 2022, 2023. I think God very well may give us more signs in the Shemitah year, 21, 22, uh, as we begin the next seven year cycle, 22, 23. But if you remember, the destruction of Jerusalem took place during uh, at, right at the end of a Shemitah cycle. Uh, Jeremiah. I uh, was telling Zedekiah he had done right in setting everybody free. But then once Babylon left because Egypt came to help, they were relying on Egypt. Then what happens? They put everyone back into bondage again. And God tells uh, Zedekiah through Jeremiah, <coughs> you did that which is right. And finally declaring the Shemitah year. This was the whole reason they went into the captivity because they hadn't kept the Shemitah year for 490 years. That's why they were 70 years in captivity to give the land rest. So the judgment fell the year after the Shemitah cycle when they didn't follow it. I'm, I'm not prophesying. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying if you look at the pattern with the signs of the blood moons, what God did. And if I recall in 2022, there's another blood moon going right over south to north through the United States of America. But I'm telling you, I think 22, 23, I'm not saying it is the beginning of the seven year tribulation, but I'm telling you, we need to be ready to see what God says because he works on a seven year cycle. In the book of Daniel, where it talks about one week is left or the, what, the last 70th week. When God talks a 70th week, he's not talking any random week. He's talking a Shemitah week. If the tribulation does not begin in 22, 2023, it cannot start until seven years later. Okay. It'd be 28, 29. I hope you understand the pattern that I'm talking about. So I'm not saying the tribulation is happening, but I'm saying we need to prepare it in case it is. Uh, and this could be the precursor, but no, if, uh, everything is great by then know that you don't have to worry about it for another seven years. Okay. Let's go back to Daniel seven, uh, verse 23 and 24. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be diverse from all kingdoms. It'll devour the whole earth, tread it down, break it in pieces. And these 10 horns of this uh, kingdom are 10 kings that are going to arise. And another will arise after them that'll be different from the first. Okay, Daniel 8. And it says, through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he'll magnify himself in his heart. But this next verse is incredible. Listen to this. By peace, he will destroy many. He'll also stand up against the prince of princes, but he will be broken without hand. Can you imagine who think what's wrong with peace? No, if there's a false peace, and I'm telling you right now, if, if there becomes uh, around this Rosh Hashanah, uh, a signed false peace agreement, dividing Jerusalem, dividing Israel, creating a Palestinian capital or state, I tell you, it's, it's time to buckle up. Okay. Look at Revelation 17, 15 through 18. We're going to go back now, connect the dots. Listen to what he said. And this tells you exactly what I just told you a little bit earlier. In Revelation 17, 15 through 18, he's talking about the waters. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the horse sits are what? Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. See, that's what the waters represent, the nations. The ten horns which you saw on the beast, guess what they're going to do? They're going to hate the whore and make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, to agree and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. 
Well, you know what's kind of fascinating about all this? How many of you know people like to use people? Well, I see they're going to, in one sense, I think the, the woman uh, is going to be a religious idolatry. And the, na- the kings of the earth are going to give her the power because they, they want her to gather everybody together. But once the civil government is tired of using religion, they're going to chuck her. They're going to kill the, this woman riding the beast. They're just using her because it all comes down to money and power. Uh, she has money and power, and they're going to use her, abuse her, and then cast her off. And then they're all going to turn and give their power to the Antichrist. Uh, in Revelation 18, 1 through 3, he says, After this I see another angel coming down out of heaven, having great authority, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he's crying with a mighty voice. Listen to what he says. It's the same thing Jeremiah was saying. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It's become a habitation of demons, a hold of every unclean spirit, a hold of every unclean and hateful bird. This refers to the birds that eat prey. For by the wine of the wrath of her fornication, we read this in Jeremiah, all the nations have fallen, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, the merchants of the earth are are all waxed rich by the power of her wantonness. Isn't that amazing? It's always about the money. Look at Jeremiah chapter 50, 37 through 40. A sword is on their horses and upon their chariots, upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her, they're going to become as women, a sword is upon her treasures, and they're going to be robbed. A drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up, for it is a land of graven images, and they are mad over idols. Therefore, the wild beasts of the desert with wolves are going to dwell there, the ostriches, and it'll be no more inhabited forever. Neither shall it be in from generation to generation. It's going to be just like when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> this is bad. But notice all the wild beasts. In Revelation 18, it talks about all the unclean spirits, unclean birds. Here in Jeremiah, we see Babylon is falling, and it's full of all these uh, unclean birds. Isaiah 13 talks about this in verse 21 and 22. Wild animals will lie down there. Their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell. Their wild goats, the hyenas, the jackals. Uh, And listen to this. Its time is close at hand and its days will not be prolonged. I think we're coming to those days. Revelation 18, 4 and 5. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Run for your lives. Come out of her, my people lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Who wants to share in a plague? Her sins are heaped up high as heaven, and God has now remembered her iniquities. Now listen to verse 6 through 8 of Revelation 18. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others. Repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her cup in the cup, uh, for her in the cup she has mixed. She glorified herself. She's lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Can you imagine, again, the same measure which we mete out to others will be meted out to us. The same level with which we were consumed with our riches, we're going to be consumed with the lack of riches. And it says, listen to what she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow. Morning, I will never see. For this reason, her plagues are going to come in one day. Death, mourning, famine. She's going to be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Jeremiah 50, verse 28, 29. Listen to what Jeremiah says. A voice. They flee and escape from the land of Babylon. Do you hear this connection? Can you see this? To declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, vengeance for his temple that's been destroyed. Summon archers against Babylon, all those who bend the bow and camp around her. Let no one escape. Repay her, just like it says in Revelation, to repay the whore here in Babylon. Repay her according to her deeds. Do to her according to all that she has done. For she has proudly defied the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Proudly defied the Lord. Matter of fact, God goes on to say in Jeremiah 51, 24, I will repay Babylon 
and all the inhabitants of Chaldea before your very eyes for all the evil that they have done to Zion, declares the Lord. Payback is coming at the same measure. Psalm 137, 8, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you've done to us. Wow. Isaiah 47, 6 through 10. Listen, these are God's words. This, this, is, this is God's words. He's very angry. Listen to what he says. I was angry with my own people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand, Babylon, but you showed them no mercy. On the aged, you made your yoke exceedingly heavy. You said, I will be a mistress forever so that you did not lay these things to heart or remember their end. Now, therefore, hear this, you lovers of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one beside me. I will not sit as a widow or nor the loss of children. These two things, he says, are going to come on to you in a moment. And one day the loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments. You felt secure in your wickedness, and you even said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge is what led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one beside me. Oh, my word. Those of you that have been around me for a while know what I say about King Solomon. King Solomon was full of wisdom and knowledge. And listen to what God says right here. You said no one sees me, but your wisdom and your knowledge is what led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am and there is no one beside me. This is uh, why we need to, you need to get that book, Destroying the Antichrist, or sorry, Decoding the Antichrist. Let's go to Jeremiah 50. I only have a couple more verses. Jeremiah 50, 45 and 46. Talking about Revelation. Listen to this. He says, therefore, hear the plan that the Lord has made against Babylon. Here's your plan in Jeremiah and the purposes that he's formed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the little ones of their flock are going to be drug away. Surely their fold will be appalled at their fate. And at the sound of the capture of Babylon, the earth will tremble and her cry will be heard among the nations. Guess what? That's exactly what it says happens in Revelation. Look at this, Revelation 18, 11 through 14. The merchants of the earth are going to weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. What was their cargo? Gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple, cloth, silk, scarlet, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and slaves, that is human souls. <clears throat> Listen to this. It, the verse closes with this. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost, never to be found again. Well, this brings us to Revelation 18, 15 through 19. The merchants of these wares who had gained their wealth from her are going to stand far off in fear of torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, that's what the harlot was clothed in, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls in a single hour. All his wealth has been laid waste. All shipmasters and seafaring men and sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and they were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads. They wept and mourned and cried out, Alas, for that great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. In a single hour, she has been laid waste. In verse 20 through 23, listen to this, though. It says, Others are going to be rejoicing rather than wailing like the merchants of the earth. They're going to be rejoicing over her. It says, Rejoice over her, you heaven and all you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has judged your judgment on her. And then it says, the strong angel took up a stone, as it were a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, and thus with a mighty, and thus with a mighty fall shall Babylon, that great city, be cast down, never to be found again. The voice of harpers and minstrels and flute players and trumpeters are going to be heard no more at all in you. The craftsmen are not going to be found anymore in you. The voice of mill will be heard no more. The light of a lamp will shine no more. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard no more. 
For the merchants were the princes of the earth, for with your sorcery were all these nations deceived. People were being deceived. And then let's go back to Jeremiah 51, 48 through 50. And it says, then, just like it just said to rejoice against her in Revelation, look at Jeremiah 51, 48 through 50. Then the heaven and the earth and all that is therein will sing for Babylon, for the spoiler shall come unto her from the north, says the Lord, as Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so Babylon will fall the slain of all the earth. You that have escaped the sword, go away. Stand not still. Remember the Lord afar off and let Jerusalem come into your mind. At this time, we're to let Jerusalem come into our mind. My closing verse here is Revelation 18, 24. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all that have been slain upon the earth. Okay, we're going to take a, a more look at this uh, next week. But uh, I hope this has been an eye-opening revelation for you. And again, uh, I just want to mention thank you to all those who help support us taking Torah to the nations. And again, I say this uh, basically uh, out of love or not out of any hope of anything else. But if, if you don't have it or if you care, uh, I really highly recommend uh, my book on the blood moons, the book on decoding the Antichrist. And uh, then I have this new book coming out about Jeremiah, which is tied right to the book of Revelation and how everything is related to today. Uh, but uh, again, let's pray and uh, let's just thank the Lord that he is revealing these things to us. It says in Daniel that things are going to be sealed until the last days and they're going to be open. And we need to uh, seek the Lord. So let's pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, uh, we just thank you so much uh, for your word. And I thank you so much that there are those around here that uh, love you. And right now I want to take a moment too and just pray for those who are sick I want to pray for uh, those who are physically ill. Lord, touch your people. Right now, we want to lift up all those that we know uh, that have physical ailments, that you would just touch them, bring them healing. Father, we want to come against this coronavirus, uh, this to be an explosion of uh, uh, this next couple of weeks of people with it. So, Father, we just want to ask you in mercy uh, that uh, you would heal your people. Heal your people. Stop the plague. We want to be like Phineas uh, uh, in the midst of the plague, running through, trying to make atonement. Father, we thank you for Yeshua, uh, that he has made atonement for us. Uh, Father, for all those who are spiritually sick, we want to pray for them, that you would spiritually uh, draw them close to you at this time. We pray, Lord, that people would not have a hard heart during these time of judgments and stiffen their neck. But we pray, Lord, that even as we read, they would repent and return to you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Father, we want to lift up all of our nation's political leaders, religious uh, leaders, military leaders, and all those from all the nations live streaming. Lift yours up as well. Father, give them wisdom so they would know what to do at such a time as this. Father, turns their hearts, uh, all of them, toward you. And Father, in particular, we want to take a moment to lift up your child, the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, and pray that uh, you would uh, turn them back to your poor, uh, Torah. These next two Shabbats, Father, while they're going to be uh, into a fourth Shabbat, Father, I pray that their hearts would turn toward you, that they would not harden their hearts, that they would not stiffen their necks. Father, as we can't help but think Passover is, is in just a couple of weeks. And Lord, uh, we just pray right now, uh, that you would touch all those uh, hearts in Israel as they keep the Passover and they can, and all those here around the world that as they memorialize Passover, that they would see the signs of the times that you're speaking to us. You're trying to get our attention. And so, Father, we just want to uh, thank you for them. Thank you for your nation. Uh, and we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. I hope to hear from you. Uh, uh, our El Shaddai emails are all open. We'd love to hear how it's going for you. And if you need prayer, we'd love to know it. And I hope to see you again this next Shabbat. Social media, everyone that you know on your Facebook, everywhere, to tune in every Shabbat right here at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed. Thank you.